Hey everyone, I thought I'd just jump on this evening, this lovely, beautiful Friday evening, and do a little impromptu express entry Q&A. This is something I haven't done for a long time. I don't know how many people are going to show up tonight. You know how YouTube is. Sometimes they promote things, sometimes they don't. But this is just, you know, really in response to what we've just seen with the STEM draw. So, who would have anticipated it? Once again, IRCC surprises everyone, and I was expecting actually that we would have had it a little bit sooner than this, but here it is, April, and just yesterday, April the 11th, they did this round of invitations, and 4,500 people were invited under the STEM category. Now, for the last stretch here, Francophone immigration has dominated everything. In fact, I've done presentations in the past on the future of, of Francophone immigration in Canada, the fact that it's the golden age of the Francophone immigrant. And I've gone, I've traveled to Quebec, done presentations for the Quebec Immigration Lawyer Association. I've done a, a separate um, a webinar for the, uh, the CELA, the Canadian Immigration Lawyer Association, just talking about the reality that, yeah, it is a golden age of of immigration for francophone speakers but today this little draw that happened yesterday i should say was at least an indication that they are still placing pretty high priority on stem occupations and of course when you're looking at the overall rounds of invitations and if we look at the previous rounds and what i want you to focus on is the numbers so when you look at these numbers, the last two STEM draws, 4,500, and then if we slide down here to uh, the beginning of December, you'll see the last one was 5,900. The scores, yes, are, are pretty high for STEM, but hey, you know, generally speaking, a lot of the STEM folks have really high human capital. So it's not surprising that the scores are still quite high. But as we can see for the general draws, we're still seeing very low or quite small uh, numbers of invitations issued per round, which of course then keeps those CRS scores um, remaining very, very high. So this is the world that we're in. And uh, today is all about your questions. So we're not going to waste any time other than tackling right into Express Entry. Alicia, Igor, and I in Whole Immigration Law, our firm, we have countless consultations with people and it never ceases to amaze me who have retained other counsel, they've hired a consultant, or they've tried to do it themselves, and then something doesn't go right. And I was super excited with this particular round of invitations because I've got two clients who were really on the fence. You know, they were the high 490s, but they were looking at doing things creatively. In fact, one of them, and if you go back to the YouTube channel and you see the video that I did just a few days ago, uh, let's see if I can pull it up here. This video right here, on the express entry surprising strategy this is one of the things that i talked about in that video we were going to do with this client which he was sitting in the four, high 490s he was stem but was not seeing rounds of invitation so what he was going to do is go back home finish up he had about eight months of foreign work experience but not quite 12. and by going back and doing that he was going to boost his score 50 points and that's something that I alerted a lot of people to last week is the fact that, look, if you are running out of options and you don't have, you don't know what you're going to do, your work permit's expiring. If you don't have foreign work experience and you've been here for a while, your human capital is fairly high, you, you know, you're in the 480s, 490s, it may not be the worst decision to say, okay, I'm going to return home. I'm going to work in a skilled job. I'm going to take all this awesome education that I've obtained in Canada, this great Canadian work experience. I'm going to leverage that into a really good job at home. And after you've accumulated that one year of foreign work experience, you can really see your CRS score jump on the skill transferability factors. So that's what we were going to do with one of the clients until, guess what? We got an ITA. And so um, it came a little bit early, and this is another strategy that I want to talk to you about. It came a little bit early because it rounded up his Canadian work experience such that he was given two years of Canadian work experience, and he isn't quite there. Not until next month will he actually reach it. So what do you do? You sit tight, you wait, you keep working for your current employer until you get that full two years, then we submit the EAPR. So for him, it's working out. Interestingly enough, he's thinking he still might go home. He's got an employer in Canada that's willing to keep him employed and he really misses his family. So for the Canadian experience class, 
he's got his ITA right now and it doesn't matter whether you're inside Canada or out. So while I'm explaining this, go ahead and post your questions. We will definitely get to them, you guys. So that was one client. And then, um, and the other client, same almost story, but STEM, high 490s, waiting for that uh, round of invitations, wondering if it was going to happen. Um, in this case, uh, quit visa holders and, uh, you know, from Ukraine, but they had very high human capital and it was just a matter of time and just waiting. And lo and behold, you guys, guess what happened? They got an ITA. So that's just two of the many clients that, uh, you know, that I can speak to right now with respect to this STEM draw. And there's a lot of uncertainty. And in reality, the PNPs are not as golden as they used to be with the Alberta Opportunity Stream, for instance, which is one of the most broad, open programs you could get. They accumulated enough of a backlog in their queue that they've got enough for 2024, their allocation. Now, it didn't help that the feds didn't give them more round, you know, more allocations in the draw. Um, kind of irritates me that they did that, but you know, the, the golden age even of the PNP is just not like it used to be. There's just so many of you. So that is kind of where we're at. So if you're just tuning in here wondering what's going on, this is all about express entry. We are going to focus hardcore on your most difficult questions that relate to express entry. We're gonna, if you have questions about other things, save those for next Wednesday at 10 a.m. when we do our, our weekly live Canadian immigration Q&A. But this is all about express entry. And it's kind of fun. I'll show you guys something. One of the things that I really, really find is uh, because of all this stuff that I'm doing online, um, I've got a fairly large presence when it comes to Canadian immigration, right? And, uh, and I have a fairly large presence when it comes to express entry. And so um, the other day, just for fun, and trust me, this is no reflection of really how good I am or not. I went over here to this little funny device called ChatGPT. And I typed in here, um, who is the best Canadian immigration lawyer um, that focuses on express entry? And then it'll probably tell me, well, Mark, um, we don't, you know, it's hard to calculate and determine that. It's very subjective. But <laughs> what does it pull up? And uh, there it is. So, for example, Mark Holthy. So, obviously, I'm doing something right. If uh, if ChatGPT <laughs> seems to seems to think that I'm someone that's out there. So, I really, yeah. So, I appreciate all of the support that you guys give me. And I love doing this. And I think by giving back and doing these free live Q&As, um, if it helps even one of you, well, then it's worth it. And I have a wonderful life. I've got a fantastic family. Um, in fact, I just rushed back tonight. Um, I was with my, uh, with my kids, Adam and Connor just came back from, um, they just came back from, uh, from Idaho. So they were in Idaho going to school and they have a little bit of a break between their semesters um, because they're doing a summer session. So at BYU, Brigham Young University in Idaho, they actually do kind of a rolling admission, so a rolling semesters. So where most schools kind of shut down, aside from summer school, they have a full track that goes from April until July. And so, um, yeah, so I was just out having a, a nice supper dinner with, uh, with Jessica and my oldest daughter, who's now married, and Connor and Adam and Deanna. And it was really nice. We missed uh, Seth, uh, Jessica's husband, because he's studying like a crazy man for his final, uh, final exams for the semester. I think Seth wants to be a doctor, I think. And, uh, and then my youngest daughter, Michaela, we were really sad for her. She was feeling miss like that she was missing out, but she is up in Edmonton taking a veterinary assistant program. And so she's just in her practicum stage. So she, that's, uh, that's what the kids have been doing and, uh, um, they've been busy and, and, not cheap having all those kids in university, but my goodness, do I absolutely love, um, love my life. And I'm a, I'm a God fearing person. I'm a man of faith. I have a wonderful, wonderful wife who really allows me to do this. And she has been an exceptional mother to our children. And boy, those kids just really make their dad proud. They all are prepared to work hard and make sacrifices and do what they need to do. And, uh, what better place, you know, um, for me to be in than, than the one I am right now. And I wouldn't be able to do any of this if it wasn't for these live streams.
the way I can reach people all over the world. And if you're just tuning in, please post in the comments where you're tuning in from, because I also love to see that and at what stage of the express entry application you're at. All right, enough chatting. Um, my daughter sent me a few pictures I'll share with you in a little bit. Um, uh, you can see my kids. I'll share those with you, but they're just kind of uploading. So there's a large group of them. Okay, let's give some shout outs here. So Pankaj is here. Good evening to you, Pankaj. Great to have you here. All right. Bavia asks a very legitimate question. 503 score, still nothing. You're right. And when we look at the general scores, they're in their 540s. There's just so many people now that have two years of Canadian experience, have Canadian education, have, you know, uh, just just really good language, excuse me, like good language scores under 30. So it's, you know, 503 would have been like years ago, like, excuse me, would have been an unbelievable score and there would have been no issues. But this, it's just, we're in a world that is so, so competitive. All right, Pankaj, here's the first question for everyone here. I have one question. My spouse is here in Canada with me. I am on a closed work permit and she's on a visitor visa, which has visitor uh, permit based on my visa. Can I apply express entry with no accompanying? If any spouse is with you in Canada and they're on any kind of a status, visitor or otherwise, I never ever, Pankaj, list them as non-accompanying because I've seen IRCC allege misrepresentation. When you say my spouse is non-accompanying, but they're actually here in Canada already. It's hard to say they're not accompanying when they are accompanying. So um, I would very, very, I'd be very cautious with that. Sure, maybe some people out there were able to explain whatever the reason is why you're listing them as non-accompanying, but you know, immigration, they're aware of it. And I hate it, I'll be honest. I absolutely hate the fact that for immigration purposes, um, they, they punish families, they do. I don't care what the freak they say about it. This whole rubric that they have established for CRS criteria literally punishes people that have spouses. And I think it's wrong. And I wish it was one factor that they would change because it makes no sense in the world to me that they would take 30 points and really it's 40, but 40 points and strip them away from a principal applicant, apply them to a spouse. Let's say it's a home where, where the spouse is a homemaker, where you know either the husband or the wife is at home um, and taking care of the children. And I'll tell you, there's no better, no holier, no higher, no honorable position in the whole world than that of a mother or father. And when I look at how they treat, um, you know, individuals versus couples, they really do punish individuals that have spouses. So I understand, Pankaj, why you list your spouse as non-accompanying, because maybe her English language isn't as strong as yours. Maybe she doesn't have the same education. And of course, the other 10 points uh, comes from Canadian work experience. So there's a big drop for people. And uh, it's really kind of twisted right now, especially with the OINP, because of those slot draws that they have. I had one person reach out, I think it was last week in the Q&A, that said, hey, can I rewrite my language score and get a lower score and use that so that I'm in the slot for the OINP? Can you imagine that? It's like it's like roulette, you know, at the... Uh, you know, at the, um, at, at, at the casino, essentially, just trying to guess. But I get it. In Ontario, things are really, really tricky. There are so many temporary residents in Ontario. There's only so many spots, even though IRCC gave Ontario a larger proportion, which I get it. When you've got a, a ton of people, a larger population, I have no problems with prorated, um, you know, allocations of the nominations. But yeah, I understand how difficult it is. I really do, you guys. So, all right. So in your situation, Pankaj, I always advise people not to do that. And we'll just finish off here. He says, of the spouse, in that case, once you get PR, what will be your status? So yeah, Pankaj, just don't do it. Don't do it. Um, if the spouse is not here in Canada, then more power to you. I'm totally fine with that. Then you sponsor her as a spouse through the family class after. But in this case, oh boy. Yeah, I would strongly, strongly discourage you from doing that. Okay, yes, Viraj, absolutely, my friend. You get on there and you ask any questions you want. This is all about questions tonight. And I tried to do it late because I knew everybody would be available. It's a long weekend. Hopefully, you guys out in the eastern coast or in Atlantic Canada where it's 10.15, it's not too late. And maybe we've got some people there. And those of you who are Pacific in Vancouver, 
um, you know, it's 7.15 tonight and I know people are out having fun, maybe on a Friday, um, or you're just recovering from a long work week, but I thought it might be great to do it tonight at a time when it was convenient for everybody. And yes, I could be spending a little bit of time with those awesome kids I was talking about, but the reality is I just don't want to um, lose an opportunity, especially these ones where you've got, um, yeah, where you've got such a crazy, crazy run of, of, of invitations. And especially for those in the STEM, there's lots of questions that people have that they just can't find anywhere. And that's why I'm here. All right, let's just, uh, I'm going to take a couple seconds. So if you've got questions, please post them. If you're new and you're just tuning in, please let me know where you're tuning in from because I absolutely want to give you guys shout outs and, uh, and just load up your questions and we'll go through as many as we possibly can. And so, um, yeah, so Bavia, I answered your question. I think we covered that one already. And uh, Marie says that she's watching from Vancouver. Great. So I hope 7.16 here p.m. is a good time for you. All right. So my daughter did indeed send me some pictures. So I want to share some of these with you guys. So this is from her recent wedding. And um, let's just pull. I just want to pull some of these out if I can. Oh, man, I don't even know how to do this. Now I'm stuck. Now I'm stuck. I've got these great pictures that I wanted to share with you guys. And it looks like it is not going to let me do that. Let's see. Can I pull them on now? No, I can't. Well, I was going to show them with you. I was going to share some great pictures with you, but for some reason, it's just not letting me, um, letting me share. One second. No, it doesn't. What the heck is going on? Uh, does that help? <laughs> I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on here. Let's see. All I wanted to do is just share a little picture of the fam. Okay, I can. Here we go. This is from Jessica's wedding here. Let's see if we can get it on here. Oh, it's a big one. There it is. There it is. So there's my daughter and her husband, Seth, and then my boys, uh, Adam, from left to right. Adam's uh, on the left side. The next to him is Connor, then Seth, then Jessica, then my dear wife, then Mark, the tubby immigration lawyer. And then my daughter, Michaela, my youngest. So that is our clan. And I'll be honest, you guys, they are the reason that I do what I do. I absolutely love them with all my heart. And, uh, and that crew right there, that's the reason I do what I do. Okay, let's jump into some more questions here. And anything is, we're, we're fair game. Now we're focusing on express entry. And I really want to drill in deep. So anyone that's here, if you, even if you're thinking about going through express entry, even if you're wondering if it's a possibility, please understand that you're going to learn something tonight. And uh, we'll make sure that we try to get through as many questions as possible. Okay. Uh, Bavia says, any chance according to you CC draw? So this is something the minister has hinted at. So Minister Miller, let's pull him up here. There he is. Minister Miller, and we'll slide him over here. There we go. It's a good spot for you, Minister. He has hinted at, repeatedly, that they are going to start to focus more on in, inside Canada, candidates that are in Canada. And what I interpret that to be is that we should see some CEC draws. Now, at this stage, we have not. And as you look at the, the, uh, the, the most recent rounds of invitations here, Minister, I'm going to have you drop off for a second. When you look at the rounds of invitations here, you can see that they have continued to do general draws, which leaves the CRS score really, really high. But I'll be honest. I honestly believe that if they are to do a CEC draw only, that we're still going to see scores quite high up here. Because the only individuals that are in this range that are not here in Canada are French speakers, francophone. So uh, because it's really hard to get that high unless you have a job offer, you know, one that supports permanent residents. Um, uh, that's, you know, even 50 points if you're outside of Canada could potentially put you into this range, but it's pretty tough. So most people, the senior executive level, double zero knocks, those ones are, are you know, there's 200 points up for grads for, uh, for those ones. So, yeah, so I, I, I think CC draws are coming, um, but the scores themselves, you guys, are still going to be high. So understand this. And okay, I, I didn't want it to be a, a what to do kind of uh, an episode because I really wanted to answer a lot of your questions. But you guys have to think creatively. And Alicia and I did a video on the YouTube channel just last, well, two weeks now ago, 
and uh, it's over here. Let's see if we can go back here. Not flag polling. Maybe it's our main one. Uh, let me go to our main site here. And if you have any topics that you're searching for, you can always just search our website. Let me go to the main screen here. I know it's here somewhere. Let's see if we can find it. Uh, the, I can't find it. That's interesting. Where are you? Me and Alicia and I just did one. Uh, there it is. This one right here. It's got 23,000 views. So this future of immigration in Canada, you definitely, if you haven't watched this video, go to the YouTube channel and do that because we cover at length some of the things that are happening from a minister's most recent speech. And you guys have to understand that there is not going to be room for everyone. There is not. And those of you whose work permits are expiring, I know because you're booking consults with me. I've, I, my days are full of consults with people trying to strategize, trying to figure out what to do. And obviously, any person who's working with an employer who isn't interested in supporting their PR and who has time left on their work permit, ditch the employer. If you can find a new employer that's supportive of PR, that's willing to consider an LMIA or try it. Um, another thing, I know you guys are, you know, you're in Ontario of you international students, over half of you and of all international students have gone to Ontario. Well, Ontario and British Columbia, really, it's tough. There's just n way many, way too many people competing for the same um, the few spots. And so I, uh, yeah, so you have to be willing to move. And speaking of move, my little visitor here. Come on, buddy. Okay, there he goes. <laughs> there we go. My little visitor there. He uh, he was waiting for my wife to come home and my and and the kids. And he's super excited every time they come home. And he sits in the window here and looks out the window. Anyways, that was little Simba making a little cameo there. But yeah, but you guys have to be willing to consider some tough decisions, you know, and when you're settled in a place, you know, you're in Markham, Ontario, you've, you've gone to school, you've worked, all your friends, all your, you know, your connections, your relationships are all there, but your work permit's expiring, you know, and, and you're wondering what the future holds. It serves you no purpose to stay with an employer um, where there is no hope of getting PR, um, unless you have recognized that, okay, I'm going to ride this out. I'm going to follow what Mark was teaching in his video over here, this one on the surprise strategy. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to go home and get another year's work experience and be up in the, you know, high, like five forties, you know, with that extra points that I get after working a year, you know, some, some of you may choose to do that, but boy, if there's, uh, you know, you have to look outside. You have to consider Atlantic Canada. You have to consider any any place where you can get a job with an employer who is willing to support an LMIA. And that labor market impact assessment is your ability to, um, to, to extend and to stay. And while you're there, understand that any employer that's willing to support you with an LMIA, a genuine one, and I know this is hard. I know there's so much fraud and corruption out there, um, but a genuine, legitimate job offer from someone in Nineveh, right? You know, I can tell you when you are on an LMIA based job offer, like when you're working and you've got a work permit and it's LMIA based, the, pro the provincial nominee programs like you a whole lot more than someone who parachutes in from another province only to try to get one of the nomination spots because provinces are savvy. They know and they're starting to really, really drill down on the fact that people are coming, parachuting in on their open work permits, working for an employer long enough to get their PR, and then they're heading back to Toronto. They're heading back to Markham. But if you are interested, like even Alberta has our rural renewal stream. I've got two presentations I'm doing. One next week. Oh, that reminds me. I've got to get my presentation to the, the Professional Human Resource Association that's hosting it uh, to employers in Lethbridge that where we're discussing Alberta's rural renewal stream as well as I'm going to be covering other options that might be available for people working in Alberta. And then I've got another presentation in Brooks, a small town in uh, also another rural community, which is growing massively. That is just really quite a multicultural community in Alberta. Um, they're also hosting a conference where I'm going to be speaking on rural renewal streams. And repeatedly, even Minister Fraser, our buddy right here, our previous minister, um, in his TR to PR pathway, which is one of the most viewed videos I think I've done on the YouTube channel, um, talked about the importance of 
uh, of rural and encouraging people to move out of the larger centers into rural communities. So I want you guys to remember those things. And if you're running out of time, you have to sometimes take big risks. And sometimes you have to do things that you are just uncomfortable to try to open up pathways that, that may not exist right now. Um, we spend a lot of time strategizing these things with our clients, but this is something that's really, really tough right now. And my heart goes out for you. And it, I'll be honest, it kind of makes me angry because this guy right here told you one thing. And his predecessor, Mendicino, who I've had lots of discussions with him and with Fraser uh, when I was on the national executive, when I was the national chair of the Canadian Bar Association. And uh, I had lots of discussions. And repeatedly they said international students, international graduates, uh, post-grad work permit holders, they're our ideal immigrant. They're the ones that we really want to target. But... What are you getting right now from this fellow? A completely different, um, you know, message. It's now you guys are taking up all the jobs. You're, you're taking up all the housing. You're overrunning our hospitals, right? Like that's the messaging that you're getting. And how just mean. I just, and I get it. Like you can't always predict, but holy crap. Like there's no getting around it. Mr. Miller and, and you know, and, and his government, our current government, have made decisions that are really starting to harm a lot of you that put a ton of money, time, effort, sacrifice for your families because you thought there would be a permanent resident pathway for you. Where is it? Minister Miller, where are these pathways that your predecessor right here said would be available? Because I'll tell you, it's, it's not good now. All right, I'll jump off of that soapbox, but understand I'm with you guys. And it, it just, it breaks my heart, the sacrifices you make. And sometimes there are things that can be done and we can canvas those and discuss those in, in consults, but it is tough. Okay, um, okay, Romano says, hey Mark, based in Waterloo, any plans for promo codes, discounts on the express entry course? Okay, Romano, there isn't, but I want to explain something to you guys. You brought it up, I wasn't going to talk about it, but... In the express entry course right here, if we scroll down, you can see a whole bunch of information and uh, we've got express entry accelerator. This is the one that we're talking about. Just, I recreated the whole thing this year. So over 10 hours of video, you can pick and choose what you want. But in this particular um, course, what I want you to understand is that this, when you purchase it, the people that bought the course in 2015, they still have access to this version at no cost. And in addition to getting over 10 hours of on-demand content that literally walks you through every part of the express entry process, when you subscribe and you enroll, you have access to our, our, our group, our community group. And it's a private group for subscribers of the express entry accelerator. And every, every two weeks on Wednesday from four to six, I do a live Q and a that's targeted specifically at this. And so and guess how many times you can come back and attend? <laughs> guess how many times? You can come back, Romino, and attend as many times as you want. And who's going to be hosting it? It's me. So you tell me where anywhere for, I think it's $349 US, access to the course, lifetime access, and you can come back to as many master classes as you want to to get questions answered. You tell me where. So that's where the value is, and that's why I don't have any plans for promo codes or otherwise. And remember, it's my time. It's me. It's not like some evergreen course that you buy and you never ever see the person live or have an opportunity to ask questions. This one is all about, in every way, shape, or form, it's all about um, just supporting for as long as your journey takes. So people who are wondering if the future is going to make, you know, if Express Change is going to be possible, you can subscribe now and benefit. And I strongly encourage people to do that, even if you're intending to hire someone to help you. Yes, in our firm, we represent people and we, we have a unique way of doing express entry applications that we absolutely love and we would hold up as being the preeminent, the best way of, of working with people. Um, no middle people. It's myself, Alicia, and, and Igor, and we've got some awesome systems and processes, but you work directly with us. Not as profitable for me, but I sleep well at night and my clients sleep well because we know we've done it right. But, um, but yeah, the whole process here is um is 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 awesome i love it and uh as far as i'm concerned the express entry accelerator here is the the best kept secret that is out there 
All right, let's keep moving to some other questions. Viraj says, to get the 50 points for LMI exempt closed work permit, C20, okay, that's a reciprocal work permit. Does the one-year experience need to be on closed work permit only or prior post-grad work experience can be considered? So immigration has been yet to define that specifically, but I'll tell you from my, from my perspective, I always take a very conservative approach and only count the one year that you've spent actually on the closed work permit. Now, I'm not saying Virage in any way, shape or form that um, if you have been working for them for three years on a post-grad work permit, and then you try to, to submit your express entry application, there is no harm whatsoever in, in taking a run at it. If immigration comes back and says, oh no, those 50 points aren't yours and you're, you're not entitled to them because you weren't working for one full year on your closed work permit, well, What's the consequence? Well, the consequence is you go back into the pool and wait till you've got the one year and then resubmit. No harm, no foul. So in your situation, Viraj, if you if it's something you want to take a run at it, there's no harm in doing it, especially if you need to wait a whole nother year, you can try. And, it, and I know this is the hard part, you guys. I've seen so many different results. I see everything. People book consults. They talk right here on our live streams. I see everything that there is going on with express entry. And in your situation, Viraj, I can guarantee there's been people that have gone through, submitted their application, used the previous post-grad work permit experience to accumulate the one year, say, yes, I worked for the company for one year and got their application approved. But I personally, you know, I, the only advice I can give you is that this has not been clearly defined by immigration. And um, although, you know, there's no harm in, in taking a run at it, um, I always advise my clients to be conservative and to um, only count from the year that you started on your C20 on your closed work permit. But like I said, it's possible, Raj, you could do it for those reasons I described and things could work out. Okay, Joko, good to see you. Um, and then we've got Bavia, 503, any hopes? I think we talked about that as well. Bavia, the, the 503 as a general draw. We saw last year when they did a bunch of big general draws that it caused the CRS score to go down below 500, but I'm not seeing that happening in the future. Not right now. I think it's the scores are going to, they're going to kind of hover right where they're at. Um, especially with the number of invitations they're giving per round. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, here's another one. Joko says, do I need to add a Canadian born son in the PR application? Do you know what? I'm going to give you one of these. <laughs> Yippers. Wonder if I got something else here I can give you. Let's see. Let's see if I got something else. Oh, I don't know. Let's see if it'll come down. It's got to load up. Is it going to load up? Oh, my kids, my adult kids over here are singing. Oh, <laughs> the confetti froze. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. There we go. Now we got our confetti. <laughs> oh, look at this. The entertainment value is off the charts, isn't it, you guys? If I had my camera, if I had this on my my iPhone camera and I had the audio connected to it, I'd actually go take my camera around. My wife's playing the piano and my kids are, are singing together. Oh man, life is good. Okay. Uh, okay. Canadian born son in PR application. Okay. You absolutely include your son in there. And there is a question that will say, is this child a Canadian citizen? And that magical little click is what removes a lot of the pain and suffering from your application. So Yes, you absolutely do add them. They need to be included in your application, um, but there's a spot to indicate that they're a Canadian citizen. Okay. Um, let's see here. Okay, here we go. This is an interesting one. Hey, Iftek, how are you doing? It's good to see you. Okay, so it's just me. Alicia isn't joining me tonight. Um, Okay, spouse did a sputum test, okay, February 11th. It has been two months on the 11th of April. Received ADR to update regarding medical. However, the field to upload doc is in my section instead of my spouse. Not a problem, if tech. Um, you can totally do that in yours. Um, if there's no spot open in your IRCC secure account for um, under your spouse's section, that's not a problem. Um, then just upload into the one that is available, which whichever one they've opened up for you. Okay. All right. Let's see here. Um, 
Okay, let's pull this one up here, Romino. This is another good question. And if you're tuning in, we're answering all kinds of questions about Express Entry. And I want you guys to give me your toughest ones. The toughest ones, the ones that you can't find anywhere else, where or there's so much confusion in your online forum or your WhatsApp group and someone is saying something and three other people are saying something else, that's the pain and suffering. But the difference between the information that I share here is that it's actually based on law, policy, and, and practice to the extent that you need to rely upon your previous experience working with immigration. I've got about 20 years behind me, um, but I love these questions. These are fantastic, and this is what I thrive on. And obviously with these lives, the reason I love them so much is because anybody can go and do the research, spending four hours and answer a question if they're willing to actually do it. But how many people are willing to go live like we do within our, the Canadian Immigration Institute, um, Alicia, uh, myself, and, and Igor, and just answer your questions straight up? And the interesting thing is when I get tough, tough questions that I don't have an answer to, I don't just make it up. I say, dang, that's a good question. And then guess what I do? I go and look it up. But the interesting thing is, as the years have passed since January the 1st, of 2015, boy, I've seen a lot with express entry. In 2014, I was on a working group with the Canadian Bar Association's immigration section providing a submission to IRCC on the proposed regulatory uh, foundation for express entry. And we offered thoughts and uh, we, uh, you know, that submission we sent to them, giving feedback on on what they were proposing. And uh, ever since that day, ever since that time and that day, I've been involved with Express Entry. I guess that's why ChatGPT, I was, those of you who are tuning in a little bit late, I did, a, I, I had, I, I was playing around a little bit here. I love this. Oh man, I love ChatGPT. I was pulling here, I said, who is the best Canadian immigration lawyer that focuses on Express Entry? And uh, as you see here, it says, determining the best Canadian immigration lawyer can be subjective and depends on various factors, including expertise, client reviews, success rates, and personal client experience. However, I can suggest looking for lawyers who specialize in express entry and have a robust track record. For example, Mark Holthy, founder of the Canadian Immigration Institute and Holthy Immigration Law is well regarded in this area. He offers comprehensive resources and courses. Yes, he does. Thanks, ChatGPT. Like the Express Entry Accelerator aimed at assisting applicants through the express entry process. And the cool thing about this is I know that the data for express entry, uh, sorry, for ChatGPT is um, I think it's up to December 2023 for the version four. And that was right when we I redid the whole Express Entry course and really designed it to be just this, an accelerator, this part. So um, anyways, yes. So it's kind of fun. Additionally, you can check platforms like this Canadian Bar Association, which I was the national chair, LinkedIn or legal directories. And so pretty cool. Anyways, I, was, uh, I always get a kick out of that. And I guess, you know what? <laughs> There's not a lot of, um, you know, I don't do this for the accolades or the praise or whatever it might be. Trust me, I love receiving a thank you from people, but just knowing that I have the ability to literally influence the lives of people all over the world who are looking to come to Canada or remain in Canada to help dispel all the confusion and the uncertainty and my goodness, the fact that our YouTube channel alone is about 56,000 through these live Q and A's, which have got to be the worst um, method for delivering content on YouTube, but still Google likes us. Why? Because we actually provide helpful information. And um, yeah, so there you go. I went off on a little bit of a tangent there. I'm really, I'm really sorry about that. I can't help it. I really, truly can't help it. I absolutely love, I love what I do. I love the course. I, you know, um, I love teaching the master classes, all of those kinds of things. So anyways, okay. So I think that we, um, uh, okay, let's take a look and let's actually answer uh, Romino's question. So I'm planning to apply for PR, don't have an IT yet, but will in the next draw and travel out of Canada. Okay, will there be a problem related to doing the medicals if I'm out of Canada for like two months? No, there isn't. In fact, there's panel physicians all over the world. And the moment, excuse me, the moment you get the medical request from, from IRCC, you can take that to any panel physician in the world to get your medical completed. And remember, panel physicians are designated by IRCC to do those medicals. So great question. 
All right, Bob the Builder. Oh, man, I'm giving you some applause, man. <laughs> That's awesome, Bob the Builder. Um, any idea about trades draw? That is so fantastic. I love that. Bob is definitely a builder. He's a trades worker. Um, no, not a thing. So when it comes to express entry and the ministerial, uh, the, the ministerial instructions, if we go back here and we look, you will see that as far as what we've heard about trade, December 19th, trade, 1,000. So this is literally the extent to which, you know, they're now focusing on trades. So I have not seen a, a program specific, like the federal skilled trade program like they used to do. Uh, they used to do two, kind of two a year. And now, uh, and, and actually the last time they did a federal skilled trade draw, they did, each of them were only 500. So in your situation here, uh, you can see December 19th, the trade occupations on that list, which understandably is, is not a, a super expansive list. And the minimum CRS score was still pretty darn high at 425. And usually the reason this goes up is because people have one, two, three years of Canadian work experience in the trade. All right. So as we go through here, you can see that that trade, that was the, we have a transport. Technically, we're kind of due for a trade, aren't we? So we'll see how those category-based draws play out. So thank you, Bob the Builder. Fantastic, fantastic role model for kids. I love that show. Very cool. Okay, this one, Mui Chi, I love this question. I'm giving another applause. There's lots of applause. And do you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to give, let's see if we can, oh, maybe I can't do this one. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's not the one I wanted. <laughs> oh, it's not the one I wanted. Let's try this again. How about this one? Is this one going to work? Let's see. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've got a few things going on here. Hey, what's this one? I got lots of different overlays here to keep things uh, happening. Oh, isn't that nice? It's like the Valentine's Day. I just love that. Okay. Well, I do love the question. The question is fantastic. So which type of LMIA should my employer apply for me before my postgrad work permit expires in October, 2024? I am tier, doesn't have the tier there, but I'm sure it's probably three or four or three or two, right? For express entry. Should I ask my employer to apply for dual intent LMIA? Heck Yes, 100%. That is the only one that they're going to do if your work permit is expiring in October. There is no guarantee that if they do the LMIA and they make it just permanent, yes, you could get the extra 50 points, or I guess if you're a C-suite level double O, you know, tier zero, 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 you are, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no guarantee that you're going to get an ITA be able to submit your EAPR and then apply for a bridging open work permit, which is the strategy. So if your postgrad is expiring in October, 100%, yes, 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 you, my friend, are going to apply for a dual purpose. And I want to shift back here once again and show you something that we are working our little tails off on is, oh, it's not up here yet. We don't have it up here yet. Um, we have our, yes, we have our um, LMIA course that we are working the Dickens on to get this up and running. So it'll be on the list, on the list, soon to be arriving, hot off the press. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, do that um, or wherever, you know, and actually even on LinkedIn, if you want to request a, a friend request, I'm more than happy to uh, connect with you through that. Okay, great question. Okay. Jose says, I'm going to get one year of Canadian work experience in three months. Okay, that's exciting. Um, okay, in three months, I studied two programs in Canada, one diploma, one bachelor. Uh, okay, one diploma, one bachelor. Uh, one, I have one diploma back home and five years work experience back home. Wow, Jose, you've got a lot here. Do I have enough for express entry? Okay, I see what you're saying. All right, so I'm going to show you guys something else that's kind of cool. Um, and this is what I want you to do, Jose or Jose. This is exactly what I want you to do. I want you to go to Holthy Immigration Law. It's actually HolthyLaw.com. I've kind of got it hiding up here above. I've got the screen just cleaner right here. But go up, go to HolthyLaw.com. And then you can see right here, if you scroll down just a little bit, you will get to our special uh, CRS calculator. I love this thing. It's awesome because as you type things in here, it automatically starts to calculate the points here. 
And once you've gone through the calculator, it will give you your express entry score, your federal skilled worker program score. If you qualify under the federal skilled worker program, um, it will give you all the information in real time. The points will build, build, build. So if you're at a stage for, for example here, let's if I go next here, if I'm at a stage where I'm doing my language scores, right? And I say, and this is fun too, because you can, it has everything here. So you'll be 10, IELTS 7.5 or higher, CELPIP 10. Anyway, so you can choose these. And let's say here, I've got um, a CLB 8. You guys know what that means, right? And then we'll keep everything else a 9 and a 9. Let's see. Oh, I, I canceled that by accident. I didn't mean to. So we'll go 8 here. And then we'll go 7. And then we'll go 8. Oh, that's interesting. It's Oh, it's, oh, it's weird. Oh, because it's already advanced to the next level. It already gives me the CRS points of 294. But if I go back in here, that's why, sorry, it was advancing. And I say, okay, I've got 294 points at this stage. Well, what happens if I get a CLB 9 and everything? So I bump this to CLB 9. That takes this up to 297. I update this one to CLB 9. That takes me to 300. And then the last one, if I bump it up to CLB9 here, the final piece, 308. So you can see it automatically calculates it, and then you can just move through each of the levels. So I'm going to encourage you to slide back there, go check out that Cirrus calculator, and, uh, and it'll tell you if you have enough for express entry. Um, at the end of the day, um, whenever I have individuals that say, hey, do I qualify? I always ring that little bell, bell and say, hey, go over, book a consult, and we can talk about all of the options, Jose. All right. Um, okay, it's me. Hey, that's a great little handle. I like that. Referring to the example of your client, I have 22 months of experience. Can I claim two years, wait to two months after ITA, then submit? Points get calculated according to date of submission. Yes, they get calculated the date you submit your EAPR. Now, with that being said, it's only work history that you can kind of let the time, you know, lapse and, and like pass and then reaccumulate the full two years. It's because Express Entry rounds up work history. IRCC knows it. This is the instructions that they provide. So if you get a, you get a benefit that, you know, that it's no, through no fault of your own, this is your current employer. You're working for them. The system is the one that said you're eligible for uh, the ITA and that you already have two years. You never misrepresented anything. So in those situations, absolutely, you're going to continue working depending on when your ITA came, right? Because you've got 60 days. So that means that you have just enough time, uh, depending upon the circumstances, to continue working to, to, to get the full 24 months. And then after that, you then have the ability to submit your EAPR uh, safely. And uh, that's how I approach it. And in the course, one of the things that I teach my students is how to prepare rockin' letters of explanation. Solid ones. And I have two that I teach about. One is the EAPR, where you have information that you're trying to explain something about the information, the questions that maybe there wasn't space enough or you had to answer it a certain way that might seem like misrepresentation unless you explained it. So I've got a separate LOE for that. And, uh, and then I have one that's specific for the documents that we're uploading. So I use those in tandem and they're like the gravy on the mashed potatoes. All right. Jose says he is 29 years. So it was Jose. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, it's heating up in here. Ugh. Ugh. I'm getting rid of this one. This is hot. It is getting warm. It's getting warm. I think it's my lights that I've got here. Lights are bright and it's nice out. The sun's coming up tomorrow. Uh, my two sons, Adam and Connor, are going to, and I think I was going to, let's just see here what I've got. Okay, there's the troops. Man, oh, those kids. I know what I'm going to do. I have an idea. I have an idea. I'm going to take, let's see here. So I have this one right here. Web one, I'm going to take, I've never tried to do this on the fly. And I'm going to call this one photo. I'm like my own studio here. So I'm going to take this one and then I'm going to go in here and I'm going to see if I can choose. Let's see, is it messages? Uh, oh, now it's tricky. Maybe it is in messages. I thought I could pull up the photo, but it doesn't look like it. Oh, let's see. Is that going to work? Oh, it doesn't really work. 
I thought it might. I was going to share a nice little picture, but how about current application? Oh, that's not bad. That's not bad. You got all the other uh, text messages that, <laughs> that I've got there on the side, but ah, nothing's confidential. It's all good. That's my kids. And so, uh, so right here, Adam and Connor are going to come with me tomorrow and we're going to go on a big long hike in a fairly remote area along the Milk River Ridge. And we're going to go looking for deer antler and uh, an elk antler. And so we're planning that trip tomorrow. I'm really, really looking forward to it. And uh, yeah, that's the troops. That's the kids. They are the reason. Okay, let's see if we can get back to where we were at here. Okay. <sighs> and, and, and Jose, my daughter, is 27. So she's pretty much your age. Okay, let's see what else we have here. Um, okay, Bavia is over in Guelph. Good to have you here joining us. Uh, Shalia's channel, awesome, watching from Calgary. Great to have you here. All right. Um, I, oh, hey, sweet. Oh, big time, Kenny. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. I can indeed read comments from X. I am so stoked. This is the first time that I've been able to do that. Kenny, I hope you've got, uh, I hope you got some questions for me. This is so cool. Yes, indeed. I can uh, follow comments on X. Oh man, that's awesome. So cool. Okay. Um, Emma Preet, she says, how long are LMIAs taking for early childhood educators in Alberta? It's been two and a half months. Okay. So one thing I want to show you is that the ability to get that answer is right on the website and you can easily just go here and I'll Google it with you. So if I go here and I go ESDC temporary foreign worker program processing times, look what I found. And once you're here, you can scroll down and there you have it. So you said early childhood educator, which is a skilled position. It probably is low wage, but you can see these are business days business days. So how many business days are in a week? Probably five. So you've got like 10 weeks, 55 days. I think my math, 11 weeks, 11 weeks. Um, so that's 55 days, essentially five business days in a week, roughly you can see. So you are, um, like that's you're, you're on track. And so it's coming close to when you're, you know, you should start to see a decision, but we have, I'll be honest, this last was updated. Um, this was for March, 2024. So it's backward looking and you guys know what's happening. It has become a mad frenzy to try to be able to, to stay. And the labor market impact assessment process is one of the pivotal ways in which you can remain in Canada to try to continue boosting your score, to extend out the opportunity to one day receive that invitation to apply or an opportunity through one of the PNPs. All right. And I think ALP, we talked about trade category. Um, I think that it's probably coming up pretty soon, ALP. We looked at the rounds of invitations already, and we've seen that within the ministerial instructions here, um, they've already done a transport. And if we go back here to see, okay, when was the last transport they did right here? And the transport was right after trade. So for all intents and purposes, if I'm looking at it, I see an ag, I see a French, I see a transport, another French stem. Mm -hmm. Maybe ag, maybe that's the next one. All right, great question. Okay, let's see here. Um, okay, and, and if you ask any questions that are outside of express entry, just bring those back every Wednesday, every Wednesday. I don't know how long I've been doing this. Like it has been a long time. If I go here, I don't even remember the oldest video like we have 889 total videos here, right? And so I can't even remember when the first, uh, the first live stream that I did was. You know, I couldn't even, I couldn't even begin to try to go through all the videos and and search and see. I I don't even think the search function gives the ability to to look at something on my own channel to see how long we've been at this. But yeah, it is. Uh, oh wow, we've been at this for a very very long time. All right. Um, thanks, Roniel. He's talking about the kids. <laughs> thanks, Emran Preet. Oh, uh, yeah. I love the family. I love them. Love them. Thanks so much for all your kind remarks. Uh, they'll get a kick out of it. One day I'll drag them all in here to say hello. Hey, I wonder. Maybe I will. That would be kind of fun. I wonder if, I wonder if they will. At least my boys. One second. 
Hey, um, Adam and Connor. You guys want to come in and say hi to my uh, live stream? That's okay. Oh, Jessica, you're going to say hi? Okay. Here's the new bride. Come on in. You have to get down where they can see you. This is Jessica. Uh, hello. <laughs> Her brothers are all getting ready to head out and I don't know. What are you doing tonight? You can't leave that fast. Swing dancing. Country swing dancing. Country swing dancing. So you better explain to everybody what it is, but get your mouth right now. Um, it's partner dancing, country style. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's a teacher, so she can handle this stuff. Awesome. Okay, yeah. I'll let you go. <laughs> awesome. Yes, they're going out swing dancing. See, what you guys, I don't know, maybe it's, you guys are used to that, but essentially when I was uh, their age, we'd go to a dance and um, you would actually ask a girl to dance and yeah, you would dance together. But over these, uh, over the last couple decades here, since my kids have uh, been born, kids just don't do that. They, you know, they mostly just, I don't know, what is it, a mosh pit or something? They just all get together and hey, who, I may even be talking to to you guys that are in this age bracket. Well, anyways, unless there's maybe a slower song or something like that, you don't really pair up and dance with somebody. And uh, But with this country swing dancing, it is absolutely all about, um, you know, asking a boy or a girl to, to, to dance, and it's country swing. So there you go. My kids, they do all kinds of fun stuff. All right. Thanks for humoring me. Okay. Let's see. Let's jump back into questions here. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see. And so, yeah, that was my daughter that uh, just got married. And her husband is, it's 856. He's still at the university studying. Good man. Good man. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see what Raniel has here. My work permit is getting expired. You bet. Understand that, guys. I'm a, planning to apply for a study permit. Can I also apply for a visitor record parallelly so that I won't be out of status if this study permit is denied? Thank you. It gets messy. It really does. I'll be honest, Raniel. Um, like if you, if you think that study permit is really the route that you want to go, remember once you go back to school, like if there's, maybe there's a real legitimate, you know, increase in points that you're going to get. But if you go from one, you know, a two year program to a three, you can go from 15 to 30 points, but you can't, you're not eligible for a post-grad work permit again, unless, you know, somehow the work permit you're on right now is an LMIA based and you've never burned up your post-grad. But this is a reality. But no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste time doing that. I wouldn't. Um, you know, put everything you got into your study permit, really provide a good rationale. And, um, and I think you kind of let the chips fall where they may. If you apply for a visitor record at the same time, immigration can, it can really confuse them because they don't know, okay, well, what do you want? Do you want to be a visitor? Do you want to be a, a student? And I think it just, I think it weakens your arguments for your study permit. Although I hope you got good advice, Renil, like to go back and spend thousands and thousands more dollars to go to school. I hope you've got a good plan. And uh, if you need a second opinion, you can always slide over to our, our website. And uh, I think you guys are already very well aware. You've been watching for a long time. You can click on speak to a lawyer. And yes, Alicia and myself and Igor, yes, there's a reason there's 4.9 star. But we do, like for 25-minute consults, we charge $315, which is 300 plus 5% GST. We do charge that for a 25-minute consult. But the difference is in that 25 minutes, we can clear up everything. We can, you know, we, you, we send you an intake form. You complete the intake form before we even get on the call. I review it before you even get there. So the moment that clock starts to run, we're not saying, hey, Raniel, nice to meet you. How are you doing? So um, tell me a little bit about yourself. No. No, 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 no. We get right into it. Okay, here's the situation. This is what you need to do. And it's 25 minutes of advice. That's the difference. All right, zipping through here. Um, great question. Roshan says, is it a good idea to move to the Atlantic province for PR? I can only get a CRS score of 45 after two years. I have two and a half years of postgrad left. That is a very good decision. It is. Now, as I tell all of the people that I do consultations with, please, please understand that what drives the ship truly, truly is employment. So it's not just moving to Atlantic province, you know, to, to Nova Scotia or New Brunswick, PEI or St. John, Newfoundland. It's, it's, it's not about just moving, but it's about getting a job there where the employer says, you know what, you know, Roshan, if you, if you come, 
We like your work experience. We like the fact you've got two and a half years of postgrad. Sure, you come work for us and uh, you know, you show us that you're someone that we really want to keep long term. Yeah, we'd be willing to support you with an LMIA. And the thing you have to realize, you guys, is that it's a whole lot easier to get a labor market impact assessment in rural Atlantic province or even a larger center in, in one of the Atlantic provinces than it is in Toronto, right? Great question, Roshan. Thank you so much. Um, okay, AK says, uh, how's it going? I'm doing fantastic. What are the chances of CRS dropping to 491? I have work permit till next January of 2025. For a general draw, unbelievably unlikely. You know, if you don't fit within a category-based draw or, or you don't have French or some other pull, right, that's going to separate you, the general draws I do not see coming down 491. I don't, not by next year. It's hard to believe that next year is 2025. Wow, that's going to be one heck of a party. So cool. Okay, uh, let's see what we have here. And I love all these questions. I love the fact that these are all based on PR. This, I can really drill into these. So thank you, you guys. Uh, Shokat says, my wife is from Morocco. In our PR application, we submitted a Moroccan police certificate that is named as Bolton number three instead of Fish. Oh, well, that'd be fine. I cannot answer that one, uh, Shokat. I cannot answer that question. Um, you know, sometimes police clearance certificates change over time. But the one thing you absolutely have to make sure is that whatever the IRCC website says, whatever they call that document, that's the one that you need to upload. Now, once again, I've heard of people who've done things and got things approved when they bloody well shouldn't have gotten them approved. And then they go and tell everybody else, don't listen to Mark. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I submitted my application and it was no problem. And then guess what happened, Shokat? Then 10 people follow that person's advice and not Mark's where I'm saying, this could be an issue. Um, and then they get their applications rejected because the officer that approved the first one didn't pay attention or was inexperienced or a new officer. And then the other officers all caught it and said, oh, you know, but let's take a look at this. Just out of curiosity, we're going to have some fun here because I can do whatever I want. So we're going to go over here and let's pull it up and take a look. So PCC, IRCC, EE. So we'll see if we can get here. Let's see which one. Uh, maybe this will work. Let's see. Sometimes it's a little bit hard to find the actual link there. Okay, so we go here. So let's type in Morocco. Let's jump down to, give it to me. Oh, it's not working. I thought I would jump, man. Oh, that's why, because I'm hitting M and it keeps pushing me up and it keeps pushing me up here to make your selection. That's hilarious. Okay, let's, let's just go down here to M then. Oh, I jumped past it. Moving up, Morocco. Okay, let's take a look here. So find out how to apply. So as I go through here, the one thing that I focus on is the name of the document. And like you've identified, you can see here, this one here, and you see this magical number right here, or, or is a blissful word, my friend. When you have a conjunctive like or, it means that bulletin number three also works. So you could have either the fiche anthropometric 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 or bulletin number three. So uh, if you're, if we're just looking at your name, the name of your document and that's it, well, you can have either or according to the instructions. There you go. And that's no, I'm not confirming one way or another because I haven't looked at your document, but hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Um, another tricky one. And says, I have 493 with an LMIA PR supportive. Any chances with CRC, or FSW? It's hard to say. Like general draws, 493, I think is still going to be too low. Maybe there's an option through a PNP because like I said, but, but I think is this LMIA just PR? Then you can't use it for the purposes of a work permit, which also kind of sucks. All right. Um, okay. Ilias says, he's thanks a lot, starting a new job on closed work permit in Ontario via French Mobilité. Yep, the Francophone Mobility Program. I have CLB7 in French. What are my chances for PR? Okay, well, I think you guys all know this. Once again, we'll go back. I love sharing right the source because this is the thing. It's all about where it's coming from. So let's go to the criteria. And then what we're going to do here is we're going to go down to the very bottom and we're going to pull up the other points breakdown. Do you see this right here? Score with NCLC 7 and 
you know, n- hardly any English versus score a French score with seven or higher plus CLB five or higher. Well, and CLC seven, that's the level that you need. So if you've got that CLB seven in French and it's in all abilities, then you absolutely do have a really, really good shot. You do because of all the category based French language, um, you know, plus obviously I don't know what your full CRS score is, but I think you do have a legitimate shot. Okay, Joe, hello, my friend. So good to see you. I haven't seen you around for a long time. Now, Joe, you are a permanent resident of Canada, are you not? I think you are, my friend. I love it when uh, people come back and and say hello. So, so cool. Okay, Uh, Prasant asks a good question. Why do they conduct limited size draws? And so, once again, if we go back here, it says, why do they conduct limited size draws? Um for general draws when the quote is around 480 for 200, 2024 because they have so many other places that they can pull from. That's why. And one of the decisions um, that the, uh, this uh, fine minister here, Miller, said, one of the you know decisions the government had to make was how do we allocate these rounds of invitations? And repeatedly over the last while, Minister Miller said we are focusing on economic needs where the demand is for labor in certain industries, occupations, that's where we're going to place the emphasis. And they also have agreements with some of the Francophone minority communities outside of Quebec to enhance and expand the French language, which Canada is a dual, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, you know, we're a bilingual country. And so they're trying to spread French more fully outside of the province of Quebec. Um, but yeah, that's why. So based on the mandate, based on what Minister Miller has said, it's not surprising that they are doing exactly that. And they, trust me, they are not going to be short. They're not going to have any problem hitting that quota, my friend. Not at all. Okay, um, let's see we've got here. Darshan, thanks for the, the nice pick he said. I got my, L, uh, my L1A managerial, okay, US visa in Canada. I'm with NOC 21232. Is there a way to apply for NOC 00 senior manager? No. If you're on an intercompany transfer, the whole concept of those types of work permits, which we do a lot in our firm, and the bat, the first, you know, two thirds of my practice, two thirds of the years of my of my professional career were focused almost exclusively on large global immigration, helping large multinational companies get these L1A equivalents, these uh, these ICTs. And um, when you're transferring, you have to transfer from a substantially similar position to the one you're filling in Canada. So. You know, ultimately, it comes down to whoever did your permit, but you're locked into 2, 21232. You're, you're locked into it um, unless they get an LMIA and switch you to a senior managerial double O. Yeah, good question, Darshan. Okay, let's see what else here. Um, okay, I'll just finish Mui Chi. She says, I meant that she's tier three. Okay. If my employer applies for dual intent LMIA, what are the benefits compared to just high wage LMIA? For the purposes of express entry, Muichi, there really isn't any any difference. If you're tier three or higher, doesn't matter whether you're high wage, low wage. Yes, you do get paid. So no wage is not possible, but it doesn't matter with the wage as long as, um, you know, obviously with ever your, your dual intent LMIA, it has to be at the prevailing wage rate, which is a separate discussion. But yeah, that's for immigration, there's no benefit or, or harm. Okay. Um, let's see here. Uh, Shazzy. Hey, how's it going? Shazzy says, Hey Mark, thank you for your express entry course. After submitting the application is changing employment. Uh, same knock is advised or have any impact on the application. Shazzy, not really. So Shazzy's talking about the express entry, um, accelerator course right here which is, I love it when people come in and they, they talk about their experiences. There's a description in the link below, wherever you're watching this, uh, you should be able to get access to the course here where you can, you can purchase it. But, um, but just to answer the question, when you submit your application, Shazzy, unless it is a job offer supported you know, application where you're getting points for your job offer, um, unless, there's any, like there, unless there's a job offer or some other reason that you need to stay employed, like a PNP nomination that's employer specific, um, it doesn't, you can change. It doesn't make a difference. Ultimately, uh, when you submit your EAPR or even when you get your ITA, your uh, actual work history is kind of locked in at that stage, subject to the rounding up, which we talked about already in this live stream. But in your situation, changing your employment, um, 
I, you know, I'll never say, yeah, Shazzy, go ahead and do it because I need more information and I recommend you book a consult. But generally speaking, so not knowing your specifics, when a person doesn't have any other restriction on changing employment, um, you know, once you've submitted your EAPR and if you want to change jobs, you can do whatever you want because your work history is locked in at that stage. Great question. Great question. I didn't even see this super chat. Okay, Questy, I didn't even see your super chat. Sorry. These need to be a priority here. Okay, so uh, Questy says, Hi, Mark. I'm in the U.S. at the moment on a STEM OPT work permit. Uh, if my PR application is approved, is it possible for me to drive into Canada? Absolutely. You can totally go through and do your landing at a port of entry. In fact, that's where I worked for, oh, yeah. While I was going uh, through law school, um, I worked on the border as an officer. So, yep, you sure can. If your PR is approved, um, your passport um, request will come. Uh, you'll send your passport in if you're if your visa required national. You'll get the, the visa imprinted in your passport and then you'll go with your COPER to the border crossing and you can land. Great question. Thank you. All right. Yes, the super chats kind of slid in there. So that's always an option. Okay. Whew. Let's see if I can find a spot. Uh, which says, thanks so much for your understanding. The tough situation, you bet. Um, let's see here. Um, yes, this is one that I wish I had something sad, some sad music that I could play. Um, I don't know if I even have any sad music. Not really. Um, nah, that's kind of cheery, like Tinkerbell. Don't have any sad music, but I hear you, Estef. Um, So sad. I planned my strategies ahead before coming here two years ago. It was straightforward then. Now I'm on a postgrad and faced with targeted draws. I'm uh, on f uh, finance. No, I get it. I, I get it. It's it's really, really tough. Okay, let's try to get to some other questions. Um, Harry says, hey, Mark, can we obtain foreign work experience by doing a remote job from Canada? Maybe. Possibly. Possibly. But I never, I never say yes uh, because there's a whole bunch of different factors that have to be taken into consideration to clearly identify that it is foreign work experience and not somehow considered to be Canadian experience. Um, there's lots of complexities with it. So Harry, I wish uh, I recommend you book a consult. Um, let's see. Oh, here we go. Joe says almost graduation time. Oh, Joe, maybe I jumped the gun. For me, Mark, subscribing on your Express Entry Accelerator was the best decision. Thanks, my friend. I'll give you some applause. And let's go with some of this, too. We'll drop some confetti for Joe. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate that, my friend. Okay, let's turn off our uh, turn off our confetti machine. I think that will keep going forever. I feel like um, maybe I, I had golden confetti, right? What, what, which, which show is that one? Um, the Golden Buzzer. So America's Got Talent? Probably, probably. Uh, I wonder if I could do that. Um, live streaming as a talent. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Mm, all right, let's see here. Um, okay, Mui Chi says, oh, yes, many benefits from buying the Express Entry course. Access anytime, no expiry date. Always have an invitation to join the masterclass and got questions answered. No regret buying the course. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> thanks so much, Mui Chi. I really appreciate that. And really, the master classes are so powerful because of the fantastic questions that people ask. Let's face it, the course itself is pretty darn solid. So if you go through and you watch the videos, you follow the instructions, and I literally walk you through step-by-step -step every single section of the EAPR information, and I have separate modules and everything that cover all of the, the, the ins and outs. If I slide over here, you can actually scroll down to the bottom and you can see what's contained in it. And uh, if, as we get down to the very bottom, you can see all the modules, every single lesson, everything is broken down here so you can see what's in here. And there is a ton of content. This walks you through every part of the profile. Um, four is all about completing the EAPR after you get your ITA. Then we've got some weird kind of stuff about the wonky checklists and previewing your score, then mastering your documents. This one I absolutely love. Every single document has its own video, templates, uh, you know, checklists, um, all kinds of things. It, Tons of sample documents are all loaded within every one of these sections. And then the final component, landing. And then we also have a bunch that are kind of in our member resource session, which is continually growing. So that's just the course itself. And then the masterclass, which I 
oh man, if I could do that all day, if I could do this all day, it would be fantastic. We're kind of into OT a little bit. It's about 9.15. I probably should start thinking about wrapping up pretty soon. But when you've got, you know, over 200 people watching a live, it's probably worthwhile to uh, uh, to keep going and, and try to help as many people as possible. Okay, DK. Oh, this is a tricky one. I used to work in a cruise line industry before for 13 years and it's on a contractual basis, six to 10 months contract. Will my experience qualify under federal skilled worker stream? Okay, so DK, you say contract, but I think you're probably still an employee. It's just that the term of your work is between six to 10 months. So here's the problem. You must, in order to qualify through the federal skilled worker program, you must hit at least one year of Canadian, oh, sorry, one year of foreign work experience that's continuous, full-time paid. So that's 1,560 hours over a 12-month period. And when you only have work for 10 months, you have to really, really be able to show that you are continuously paid and that two months is kind of like a teacher. So you make the pitch, you make the argument. So teachers here, like my daughter who just joined us in a little cameo there, um, she's a teacher and she gets the, you know, the summers, uh, July and August off. So she's not actively working, but she's still full-time. She continues to be paid. So in those circumstances, you can make the case. But I know what the cruise line industry is. It kind of sucks, right? Um, don't get me wrong. You know, it can be really good and you can see the world and travel around. And I, I get all that. But when it comes to the federal skilled worker program, unless you have at least one stretch of time, all continuous, where you have at least one year, subject to other things, but generally speaking, the, the 67 point threshold um, under the selection factors, that, that total out of 100 is not hard for most of you to hit. And so with one year of continuous full-time work experience, most of you really can reach the minimum. But if you don't have it, then you just, you can't qualify. And if you're on a contract and you're actually not paid and you're actually not working, it becomes really, really difficult. It works where individuals are, where the, the compensation continues to flow and that two months off is a negotiated part of the employment relationship where you are continually employed. But like you said, con contract, yeah, where they just cut you loose and don't pay you. Yeah, it's really difficult. But DK, you might want to just book a consult and we can try to dig in a little bit deeper and see if you might have something somewhere else within the past 10 years. Because once you hit that one year, then you can use bits and pieces from other work histories as long as they're all skilled, you know, tier three or higher, paid, um, you know, 30 hours a week, whatever. You can count that as full time. Okay. Um, <laughs> oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Yeah, okay. This one right now, I want you to pay attention to this. I'm going to find a new, here we go. <laughs> pay attention. Here is a case suggestion. <laughs> my daughter's married, so she's not on the market. Easiest way of PR, finding single moms on Tinder and Bumble. At least don't have to pay 30K for useless LMIAs. Oh my goodness, AK. That is, that is so sad. That is so sad. If you are in a genuine relationship with a Canadian citizen and you fully intend to get married regardless of the situation, then yeah, that spousal sponsorship, spouse common law partner in Canada may very well be an option for you. But I would never under any circumstance People could go on Tinder and Bumble for the sole purpose of finding single moms to marry, okay? Um, because trust me, if you're going down that path and you're getting married, it's going to cost you a whole lot more than $30,000 for what it takes to actually have a successful marriage. Now, 1995, June 10th was a pretty awesome day in my life. That was the day I married my wife. And can you imagine, we are closing in on how many years? Like 2024, 2025, June, next year. Is that 30 years? Oh, no. Is it really? Yeah. Wow. I guess I have something to say about marriage. It's freaking awesome when you find the right person and you're willing to make sacrifices and forgive each other's shortcomings and, and you're committed to something more than 
does she make me happy? Who freaking cares? Do you make her happy? That's what's important because if you make her happy, I can guarantee she's going to want to stay with you and vice versa. It's all about both parties giving a hundred percent, not 50, 50. And that's why most marriages fall apart. All right. Okay. <laughs> Continuing down the road. Oh boy. We're talking about a lot of different things today. This is quite entertaining. Okay. And I appreciate all of you who are on so late in Eastern Canada. It's like 1220 in Atlantic Canada, 1120 in uh, Toronto over there. And then 820 in Vancouver and 920 here. So thanks for tuning in. Okay. Let's get to a few more questions here. And I apologize if I don't get to all of them. We'll keep zipping through. Um, and if I haven't gotten to your question, it's just, it's just, I have to pick and choose the ones that I think are going to be the most benefit. If you have a specific legal question, that's when I ring the triangle. I say slide over to our firm and book a consult and we can really dive in deep and give you advice that you can rely on now to plan what the future holds for you. Um, otherwise, join me for next, every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Mountain Time. Alicia and I are here answering questions. Um, if you do want a question to be bumped up, there always is the super chat and I always answer those first just out of respect for people who do that. Um, but uh, let's keep going and see what how many more we can get to. Maybe we'll go another 10, 15 minutes because I know people need to get to bed too. Who knows? Maybe you guys are all up partying all night and once this is over, you're going to go out. I don't know. But uh, anyways, let's keep doing uh, what we're doing here. Um, oh, here's a good question. Oh, this is a great one. Wishwa. Wishwa. Oh, it's not technically express entry, but we'll hit it. Uh, do you have any updates about what will happen to students working hours limit? Mm. I, you guys have heard rumblings. Don't quote me, but I have heard rumblings that IRCC is considering changing the minimum work hours for students to 30 hours instead of the old 20 hours. I'm not talking about what's happening as it comes to an end, this full-time work thing, but changing it to 30 hours per week at, at a maximum that you can work versus the old 20. Okay. Um, ah, jazz jeet. Jazz jeet, jazz jeet. Ugh. I applied for a post-grad work permit extension and application due to passport expiry. However, I applied online just to get temporary extension. What happens if they reject my application? Just cheat. Ugh. Ah, let's see. This, I hate when I have to do this. I hate when I have to do this. Um, let's see if I can pull it up here. I don't know if I can pull it up here. Um, it's really hard to find it. Um, it's really, really hard. I don't know if I can find this here. I'm just, just bear with me here as I'm moving my mic around and trying to get, I don't know if I've got time to try to dig this up. Um, Uh, I don't think I can find it. Um, there is a program delivery instruction on this exact topic, but I cannot seem to find it. Um, okay, I can't find it, but I'll just tell you. Okay, Jezjeet. If you have... If you have, let me get in the mic in my good position so you guys can hear me. All right. If you guys, um, if you have applied for a post-grad work permit um, and it is because your passport was expiring soon and you have more time that you can recapture, that application must be applied on paper. So if you've done this through the online process, Jazjeet, oh, I recommend you book a consult. But... If you've applied to extend through online, that's not the process. And it's highly likely that the application will be rejected if it wasn't submitted in paper. So what happens? You need to book a consult because I'm really, really concerned for you. Really concerned. Okay, let's see. We've got Varun over on LinkedIn. Hey, we're getting a good a little bit of reach. Can I apply for GCMS notes even if my PR application didn't cross the maximum processing time, but it's more than four months? Yeah, you can apply for the GCMS, GCMS, uh, GCMS notes anytime you want, Varun. There's no restriction, so you can do it. Okay, um, 
Here's a great question from Anil. I'm going to give Anil some applause here. If I claim 50 points for my employer who supports PR, suppose I get an ITA and submit it. In between, if I lose the job, do I still have chance of getting approved? It is going to be a serious problem for you because the 50 points, if your employer is no longer supporting your application and you've lost your job, you have an obligation to not- notify IRCC. And the 50 points, an essential component is that that employer will have a job open for you for a year after you become a permanent resident. And if you've lost your job, that unravels everything. And the points, if they're gone, then when an officer assesses your application, they will reject it because you will no longer have the CRS total uh, that you that you, you know, needed um, to have received an invitation in that round of invitations. So, you know, unless there's some crazy world where you didn't need the 50 points and still were eligible, yeah, it's just not going to work. Okay. Um, let's see here. Oh, we got a super that popped in here. Um, okay, it's Questy again. Uh, what are the cons of driving compared to flying? Um, there's not really any cons, you know, when you're driving, you can take more things with you um, when you're going through the border. Um, like when it comes to landing, and this is really about, you know, finalizing PR. So Kwesi's other question uh, related to, um, you know, is it possible to drive into Canada? A port of entry is a port of entry. The process is the same when you're ultimately before an officer. Um, yeah, I don't think there's really any substantial difference between the two. I don't think so. All right, let's see. Oh, it kicked me back to the beginning. Okay, let's just get to some other ones. We'll ask a few more and then we'll kind of wrap it up, you guys. Um, Let's see. I think I found my spot here. Um, Okay, here's a good question. Oladeo says, oh yeah, my back is feeling it right now. I currently meet the CEC criteria and my score is 450. I've been working for my employer since 2021 in HR. Do I select yes for having a valid job offer? The only time for the purposes of express entry in CEC, you would say yes to a job offer is if that job offer was supported by an LMIA or you are on an employer specific work permit and you've worked for that employer for a year. So I suspect in your situation, you probably are working on a post-grad work permit. And if it's an open post-grad work permit, it does not, it's not considered to be a job offer for the purposes of express entry. So um, the answer would be no. Okay. Um, oh, wow. I guess we're quite a ways behind. You're even commended by chat GPT. Yeah. Chat GPT is my, that's my jam. <laughs> that's my buddy. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Rue says I did my medicals last year and my application got returned. What? What? Rue, did you not, did you not go to the Canadian Immigration Institute and subscribe to the Express Entry Accelerator and get all of the answers that you needed, including in my master classes. Did you not do that? Okay, application got returned. Can I still use my medical in the future? You might be able to. If it's Express Entry you're talking about, Rue, you don't provide your medical up front anyways. But often with my clients, if they have an old one, I'll include a letter of explanation saying, hey, just so you know, Here's my old immigration medical, the e-medical information sheet. And uh, if you need me to do a new medical, I'm happy to do it. But I did one just recently. So I will often do that. Okay. Oh, Rue says the PR application was returned as incomplete. Yeah, that's too bad. Blah, that's awful. Awful, awful. Answer still stays the same. Okay, um, let's see here. Here's a great question. (laughs) And this is a tough question. And I will give you some applause. And I will give you a little bit of confetti too. I'll give you some confetti as well. All right. When I get my PR supported LOIA, can I claim points right away? I have a post-grad and two years with my current employer. Yes. When the LOIA is approved, you can claim the points right away. And that goes the same whether it's uh, a permanent LOIA or an LOIA supporting a work permit, a dual purpose. Um, you can claim the points right away. <laughs> Which is thanks for complimenting my questions. I'll give you some more compliments. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. 
Oh, great. Please. It's me. Says I was using the calculator on your website and got an error when adding an LMIA. Okay. Please, please let me know because it's all a matter of how you answer the question. So if there are any errors whatsoever in the calculation, I'm just looking here to see if I can find an email, but I don't have an email. So let's see if I can just do it here. I want you to send an email to, and I need to change the text color to white so you can see this. Uh, maybe not. Let's do black. Yeah. Okay. Let's see here. Okay. That works. Okay. I want you to send an email right here to info at hopefullylaw.com. It's me and explain. And if you can take a little screenshot of how the, the calculator made an error, please, please let me know. Okay. Please let me know. Cause we hadn't seen anything when we were testing it, but these things happen. So if you can do that, send it to info at hopefullylaw.com. I would really appreciate it. Thank you so much for letting me know. Okay. Let's see here. Um, Uh, do, do, do. Does a foreign nurse need a Canadian license in order to be eligible for EE healthcare draw? No, you just need the job experience. The six months in the previous three years, that's all that you need. Um, okay, Bavia says, after marriage, how can be the CRS score remains the same? Can we say no to the company, the spouse question? And once I get PR, then apply for her. Okay, so Bavia, if your spouse is here in Canada with you, I never ever list them as non-accompanying. Never. You have to include them. If they're not here, then you can. And if you list them as non-accompanying, then they calculate your points as an individual, as a single person. But if you have them included as a dependent, then essentially 40 of your points are stripped away from you and assessed against your spouse. So your spouse that's accompanying you, uh, 20 points for language, 10 points for education, and 10 points for Canadian work experience. So you can see there's a big swing that's possible in those situations. Okay. Thanks, Rue. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. We're still doing good here. Um, and we're going to try, like I said, to keep these express entry focused. Okay. Akib says, I accepted employment while studying but worked only 20 hours. And once the study was completed, I continued with the same employer working 37.5 hours. Do I split the work into two and express entry? Well, you can't claim any of the work that you obtained while you were studying full time. So that will go in your personal history. And yes, you would split it. And the work that you continued after you completed your studies, um, that well, on your postgrad work permit where you're working 37.5 hours, um, that work experience, you would then count in your work history section. Um, but remember, um, you can only count once you've submitted your postgrad work permit. So that's, that's the key. If you're on a full, if you're a full-time student, you can't count any of those, uh, work hours, the Canadian work experience, um, towards CEC. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty Jessica looks like Mark. I hope not. I hope she looks like her mom. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, I keep saying I don't have a receipt for the stu from the studio for my digital photos. What should we do in such case? I don't know what you mean by receipt. You don't need a receipt. Um, yeah, you don't need one. Um, okay, we'll try to get to as many different people as we can. If you've asked multiple questions, I'll try to touch on one. I'm trying to wrap it up here, see if we can get through. I know we've got a lot left over here. Um, so I'm really going to focus on express entry questions, guys. So if they're you're asking about study permits or other things, I'm going to skip through it. Uh, Gurpreet says she likes my, or he likes my show. Thank you very much. Um, and Karen's asking a lot of questions about Polytechnic. I'm skipping those Karen, cause we're just focusing on express entry, but please come next Wednesday and you can ask any questions you want about it. Okay. Yeah. Maximilian says, does ONP tech draws score drop below express entry stem draw? Can you debunk this, Mark? There is no rhyme or reason, I'm sorry, to the ONP's decision making. I'm sure they have something internal and they will look at what the general and uh, express entry draws. And I'm assuming within tech and stem, they will look at those as factors in where they allocate and, and situate the slot. But ultimately, there's... We've seen all kinds of things, right? 
And traditionally, when the OINP started doing the human capital priority stream draws, they would always go just under, just underneath um, the general draws. Well, with general draws at like 540 some points, it's really tough to know exactly where they're going to settle. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, <laughs> yeah, she's not here, VK. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see. We're continuing to zip through here. Melissa says, in the French pool with a score of four or five, what do you think? Well, if they do large draws, we've seen French only. So my back is like just killing me. I've been playing a lot of pickleball lately. And tonight, oh my goodness. Oh, I, I strained my back a little bit. So I am definitely going to put some ice on it. And hopefully it's good tomorrow for our big long hike. But oh, I love pickleball. Have you guys ever played that? My goodness, it is so much fun. And I was super, super active all my life. I played so many competitive sports. Volleyball, I played in college. Basketball, I played. Um, I, uh, I did track and field. I did high jump. I went to the Olympic trials for Canada um, uh, in, in track and field for high jump. And I did all of these different things and it takes a toll on your body. But then I discovered, and I played tennis, I played all things. But it, everything is so hard on your body once you start getting older, and especially when you abuse your body as badly as I did. Just so many competitive sports. It was, uh, yeah, it wears on you. But anyways, pickleball works, at least unless you play it almost every single day, which I got caught up doing. You know, every lunch I'd be out playing, and I've been doing a lot of it. It's been so much fun, and it's been a real learning curve because it's a different kind of sport. But anyways, uh, my back is bothering me right now. So I can't wait to get off of this call so I can go put some ice on it. Okay. Um, Steph says for rural renewal, is it worth trying if I'm under a finance profession? doesn't matter. It depends on the community. Each community has their own set of rules. And uh, like, for example, Lethbridge here where I live, um, I just had meetings with the rural renewal stream and one of the heads, he and I are on the, uh, we chair the, the uh, employment working group for the Lethbridge uh, immigration partnership, the, the lip, the local lip. And, uh, that, um, yeah, the, uh, we had discussions about the, you know, the different restrictions and for the rural renewal stream, generally speaking, they go by particular industry. So I guess technically even a finance position within, if you're working in one of the, you know, manufacturing or one of the categories that Albert, like that Lethbridge has designated as a priority for their stream, it just comes down to whether or not you fit within the community. It's not really by occupation. Excuse me. Okay, let's see here. Um, <laughs> Tanafu. <laughs> oh, this is kind of funny. I love this one. Isn't targeting French speakers express entry labeled as a demographic engineering, which is a crime? <laughs> it's not a crime in Canada. We are a bilingual country. And... Um, Canada wants to see more French speakers all over the country, not just um, focused in, in Quebec. So yeah, I don't know where you would say this is a crime, but you know, I'll give you, I'll give you a, I'll give you a special, let's see what I can give him here. No, not that one. Not that one. This one. There we go. I'll give you that one. A <laughs> not a crime, not a crime. Okay, let's see where we're at here. Um, and remember, anything that isn't related to Express Entry PR, I try to kind of move away from it. So Karen, even though you've posted it 5,000 times, I'm not answering your question. Okay, uh, let's see here. Okay, Tanvir says, I hopefully get SIMP by May 15th. Should I apply for my family visa based on my postgrad or wait for SIMP and apply for an op uh a spousal open work permit. Can't tell you, Tenvir. Both options are potentially possible. Um, sometimes when we apply for temporary documents for family outside, when they're in the midst of a PR application, those overseas visa offices will deny those because they say, hey, your family doesn't have temporary intent. They intend to stay in Canada permanently. Um, you know, obviously for work permits and things like that, they should be a little bit more flexible. But, you know, there's no harm in applying. Let me put it that way, Tanvir. There's no harm. So if you did it, it's not going to be the end of the world. You can still, you know, if they get it refused, it doesn't impact on your PR application, provided you always disclose it. Okay. Let's see. Um, what is next here? Ah, Deval, another round of applause. 
and more confetti. So Duvall says, I was a member of your tier to PR pathway group. I got my PR and will soon become a citizen. Thank you. Duvall, that makes me so unbelievably happy. And I want to tell you something. That program did more for my family financially than anything in the 20 years of practice that I've ever had. I had probably 500 people that went through the program. You know, at the time, I, I think I charged, you know, $400 Canadian or whatever it was for, for, uh, for access to it. And of the people that, you know, the 500 plus people that went through that program, I was the national chair of the Canadian Bar Association. I shared everything freely. When I, everything I knew about the program where others would maybe kind of conceal it, hide it, I shared openly. I shared first with the Canadian Bar Association and all my members. Then I went live to tell everybody about it. And if you go through my YouTube channel, you can see how that frenzy back in 2021. And so Deval, yeah, I am so happy for you. That is so cool. I love doing these short-term courses and, and just helping people because often, you know, they're, they're just, well, it's just going to be crazy. And I'll tell you, I'll let you in on a little secret. For those of you in Alberta, I'm actually considering doing an Alberta, Alberta Opportunity Stream, AOS, um, a course to teach people how to do it. Um, because I think come January, if they decide to open it up, then it's going to be a mad rush to file. And people who are prepared, who know exactly what they need, who have all of their documents all in an, all in order and, and everything ready to go, um, if it's a race to file, like I think it's going to be, there may very well be, um, you know, uh, a huge, huge benefit to just having things prepped. Now, Alberta could say we're only going to do these occupations and that's fine. We'll see how it all plays out. But Duvall, thank you so much. So cool. Um, yeah, so Anna Rog says, I do not see Alberta inviting people with family connection and occupation in demand. Have they stopped it? Well, they haven't stopped it. The problem is that they've got so many people in the Alberta Opportunity Stream and even within Express Entry, they have so many people to choose from now that they can be very selective. So they are still choosing by occupation and demand to some extent. But people that are working that can demonstrate that they're economically established in Alberta are definitely getting the first kick at that can. Okay. Um, let's see what's next. Uh, <laughs> have you had dinner markets getting late? I did. I had a wonderful dinner with my wonderful family, my kids. And uh, I think I shared, uh, yeah, some of you already shared with you um, some of the, the pictures of the fam and my children and, I wonder what I got here. Oh, this is a classic. I love this one. I wonder if I can share this one with you. Uh, let's open it with preview. And let's see if I can go back to, I tried to do a duplicate where I could um, where I could share. Uh, I don't know if I can even do it. Uh, one person, two person uh, list. I thought I duplicated it. Maybe I didn't. Oh, photo. This one. Let's see. Let's see if this works here. Did this work? Oh, yeah. Oh, close. Oh, close. Let's click on this. Is that going to switch over? Oh, one person photo. Let me try. Let me try to switch it over here. Um, preview. That's where it is. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so this is another. <laughs> I don't know why Michaela ended up being the one, probably because she was the smallest. But yeah, <laughs> there's the kid. So Seth, he was uh, old Seth here. He was studying at the U of L, so he didn't have an opportunity to come out. But we had a wonderful supper tonight with uh, my two sons, Adam and Connor. We're back from BYU, Idaho, in Rexburg, and uh, unfortunately, little Michaela here, she's up in uh, finishing up her practicum for her program up at Nate, the Northern Alberta Institute of Technology, um, up in Edmonton, and then she's going to be coming home in a couple weeks here. But uh, yeah, super fun, <laughs> super fun. That's what's happening in the healthy, the healthy house. So yeah, my tummy is full, Joe. I ate probably way too much more. Yep. Okay, let's see what's next here. Um, uh, um, you, the Q&A is, you can always go to the YouTube channel and you'll see when, uh, when uh, live Q&As are scheduled. But if you go to the channel and you actually subscribe, make sure you subscribe, okay? When you subscribe, then you'll get notified when we're going live. So for example, this one right here, I'm going live right here. And these are the other live ones. But on the main channel, uh, Prem will probably post it. I don't know. Let's see. Is it coming up uh, live now? Oh, it doesn't. Uh, you will see here right at the top of the page, 
when you subscribe and make sure you, you ring that bell or whatever it is. I can't remember what's associated with it so that you get notified when the live stream starts. But 10, 10 a.m. Mountain Time, noon Eastern Time is when we go live. Okay. Thanks for asking. Okay. Um, okay. Jessica says, I applied for uh, Jessica. Yeah. I applied for express entry last November, got 476 points. I haven't received an invite. Postgrads expiring in August. Based on your experience, do you think I could get an invite before my permit expires? Not if you're hoping to get one through the general draw. It's as simple as that. Um, you know, if you want to book a consult, we can talk about all the options and see what's available. Um, and see if there's any alternatives, things that you can do to change or, uh, you know, adjust your strategy, but realistically with a score of 476, yeah, it's very unlikely. Um, uh, if tech, as far as doing anything medically, so he says, what has been your experience on working with clients who were asked to do a sputum test? Do you really need to do a re X-ray if your test results for sputum was negative? Um, if tech, Whatever they tell you to do, that's what you do. And I don't question it. I don't, uh, you know, I don't try to push back or say, hey, it's not necessary. Whatever they ask, I comply. Simple as that. And if it's a little bit of extra money, then, then that's fine. Okay, here's a great question from Melissa, which many people screw up. She said, should I use the same knock code in express entry as my work permit issued under? The lead statement does not match the, that well, but my permit was approved. Melissa, this is a nightmare. If whoever helped to get your work permit really screwed it up, if they did not pay close attention to your knock code, making sure that they chose the right one. Sometimes, sometimes representatives, and doesn't matter, lawyers as much as consultants, in order to get the work permit will kind of not fudge things, but they will, they won't really focus closely on the duties that you are performing when they select the knock. Sometimes people will choose a knock because, well, Maybe it lines with, say, an intercompany transfer and you need to transfer from a substantially similar role. Maybe under CUSMA, the Canada-US-Mexico agreement, if there's a professional category like management consultant, they will try to bring you in, um, you know, on that knock code when maybe it's not the best one for you. So, yeah, there's issues, Melissa. I recommend you book a consult. I know I'm saying this a lot, but that's the only way we can really talk about it in detail and really get to the bottom and see what options are available. But if your work permit has a certain knock code and it's employer specific like that, then if you go and say your express entry knock code is something else, IRCC is going to wonder, they're going to ask questions. Now, yes, I get it. Sometimes they will, they won't catch it, you know, but generally speaking, most savvy uh, officers will. Okay. Um, last one. We'll end right here with Tanvir. Uh, thanks for answering my question. First time to chat live and it is real. Well, yeah, it's real. Um, can I be rejected for proof of funds even if a friend in Canada gives an attested letter that he is giving me 20K as a gift? I've always said, Tanvir, that family, family give money, friends loan money. And so you can always do a sworn statement and do everything that you can to, to prove it and an officer may accept it. But the funds are not to be meant to be a loan. And how many friends just give you $20,000 as a gift? That's one freaking awesome friend. Uh, so the onus is on you to establish it. So I advise my clients never to, to do that. But, uh, you know, if you are, like you've said here, let's see. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, friend in Canada. I don't know if you're in Canada. I'm assuming maybe if you're in Canada and you're a CEC, you don't need proof of funds. But... Yeah, I would definitely, yeah, I'd definitely be very cautious of going down that path. Okay. Melissa, no, the officer doesn't. <laughs> they, they might, sure. And understand, if, if they get it right, they get it right. If your duties that you perform are the duties, titles are not everything. So, yeah. All right. We're going to end it right there. It was a great, great live Q&A. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining me tonight. And uh, congratulations to all of you who received invitations to apply in the last STEM draw. Um, remember, at our firm, um, Holthy Immigration Law, the way we work with our clients is pretty cool. It's a different strategy. We don't take control over your application. You maintain control, but we help you get everything right the first time. We work directly with you, myself. When you book, it's with me. 
It's with Alicia. It's with Igor. There's no middle people. You work directly with us and we show you, we teach you, we educate you. And then we work collaboratively together to get your application perfect. It's reviewed, any changes needed. And then we even submit it together, but you retain control. That's the difference. And the next master class is coming up. We did one this week. It was awesome. The next one's going to happen in a couple of weeks, but now is the best time to subscribe to the Express Entry Accelerator. It really is right now because when you do it and you have chance and time to go through all of the crazy volumes of lessons, which, you know, I, as I go through, this is a, it doesn't give you a, a very good, you know, overview, but if you look here, you can see of the six modules plus the mastering your documents, like we're into 60, 65 and counting individual lessons that walk you through every part of the express entry process. So definitely consider enrolling. There's a link in the description below. As far as I'm concerned, there's nothing out there in the market that can even touch it. There is not only all of those lessons and they're not, they're not garbage. They're not crap. They're not fluff. This is really detailed stuff, as detailed as I can make it and still be beneficial for everyone. And hey, if you've got a question that doesn't quite fit, that's why we have the masterclass, okay? So, and those, once you buy it, you have access to the course for life and you have access to come back to as many of these masterclasses you want. So you put that out there and see anywhere in, in internet land where you're gonna get that. And it's me, just like you see here. All right, guys, take care. Have a wonderful evening, a wonderful weekend, and all the best as you navigate this crazy world that we call Express Entry.